Good morning. morning. We welcome our guests and visitors, and we welcome those of you following us online. This is the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it as we worship our Lord and Savior this morning with a divine service, a setting three. Again, offering, if you're moved by the Spirit to give to the Lord here, I'll please place it in the basket in the back. Uh, Communion again, we come up pew by pew. Please remain standing. I will... um, Place the wafer and then place the individual cup in your hand. I'm just going to wear a mask um, for if to make everyone feel comfortable and, and secure. I'm, don't worry, I'm not sick at all. Um, but numbers going up and everything else, you know, just make you feel more comfortable. I will have a mask on when I'm distributing just because I will be in close contact with everyone then. Um, our hymns for today. Oh, give me a second or something in my eye. Okay. Our hymns for today, they focus on our epistle reading, Philippians, which is our sermon text, which we're focusing on. And so that's why I've chosen the hymns. So our first hymn is actually, it's got a Chinese tune to it. We've never sung it before. We're singing it for the first time. And I looked at it, and he's like, well, I can sing it. There's no other tune that works with it, so it's more of a Chinese tune. I think that's what you were just playing before, right, Alan? Yep, so if you heard that tune before, that's what the tune is for this hymn. Um... So again, hopefully we sing out loud for that one. I asked if we had any Chinese instruments we don't to play along with them. Um, Because I found this this hymn on YouTube, and they actually played along with, like, the Chinese drums and uh, the triangles, cymbals, and it made it sound really good. Uh, But we don't have those means here. Unless any of you know how to play any Chinese instruments. It doesn't look like it. (laughs) Anyway, so that's our opening hymn. Our sermon hymn, which is really focusing on the um, Philippians reading, Alan did change the tune to that one to a more familiar tune, so if you follow along in the hymnal, it will be different than the notes in the hymnal. And then, along with that, our sermon hymn and then our closing hymn are also doxology hymns, where we stand for the um, final verse in reverence to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So actually, for the closing hymn, we'll just remain standing in case I forget, just remain uh, standing as we will sing that one. With that, we do begin worshiping our Lord today with our opening hymn, 871, Greet the Rising Sun.
rise as you're able to do so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, <clears throat> let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us his forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor and miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a call and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the Kyrie. Let us pray. Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. Deal with us not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the 19th of Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 25. 
On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of our Lord. The epistle for this morning is from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of our Lord. We rise for Alleluia in the Gospel reading. <laughs> the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while well, the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of our Lord. Now make a confession of our faith with each other and to each other with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. May we see as we join in worshiping our Lord with hymn 870, Now that the daylight fills the sky. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you all from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and our helper, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lesson for consideration today comes from our continuation, actually our um, final in the book of Philippians. <clears throat> in the name of Jesus Christ, your people of God, the last verse of our epistle lesson for today has to be one of the most misinterpreted Bible passages out there. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know where you find this Bible verse most of the time? On motivational sports pictures. You know, you, know, you can play football the best, you can track through anything the best because God gives you the strength to get through it. And in all these, it says that very thing. I can do all things, well then it says, through Christ who strengthens me. You know, the suggestion is that you can do almost anything imaginable if you just put Jesus Christ first, and he's going to strengthen you to climb mountains, to swim your best, to play your best, to do your best. If only you put Christ first, who strengthens you. But that's not what this text is about. You know, I find Tim Tebow fascinating, especially when he's playing football. What did he do? You know, he took a knee to give thanks to God for, for um, getting a touchdown. And I think he even put um, Philippians 4.13 under his eyes, I believe. I know he had John 3.16, he put Bible verses under his eyes. But the text is still not about scoring touchdowns or not scoring touchdowns at all. It's, that has nothing to do with sports. Here is what we're going to see in our text. More so what that verse was about. Not this, but what we believe about our ultimate reality that shapes our community our convictions, and our contentment. 
Well, before we dive into it more, we kind of have to backtrack a little bit and really look at the whole book of Philippians. It's a, written, it's a letter written to the church, ancient city of Philippi. And this letter, you know, is written by Paul. Most of these epistle letters are written. Not all of them, but most of them are written by Paul. Now, we know that, you know, like I said, Paul wrote many other letters to other churches. But to me, this letter seemed really personal. There's a couple reasons for that. First of all, this is the church that Paul had started himself in the city of Philippi. And you can read all about it in Acts chapter 16. Paul shows up in the city of Philippi and starts sharing the gospel with folks. And the first person to receive the gospel is a wealthy businesswoman named Lydia. And then, like, immediately after that, he casts all of a demon out of a slave girl. And then he and his companion Silas save the life of a suicidal Philippian jailer and end up baptizing his whole entire family. So by the end of Acts 16, you've got a businesswoman, a slave girl, and a Gentile jailer who convert to Christianity. And boom, you've got a church. And now the start of the Philippian church is certainly amazing, but I want us to focus on how unique this community, this church is, and how unique it is that God would use Paul specifically to start this church in this community that's, that started the church. Well, as you know, prior to you know, Paul's conversion to Christianity, you know, he was known as Saul. And he was a Pharisee, an elite group of Jewish leaders and scholars at this time in history. Whenever morning, Pharisees had a prayer that would start something like this. God, I thank you that I'm not like the woman or tax collector or the slave or a Gentile. So every morning, Paul or then Saul as a Pharisee would pray that. You know, God, I thank you that I'm not like these people. Well, what happens in Philippi? God uses Paul to share the gospel with a woman, a slave, a Gentile. All these people that as a Pharisee he would not associate with, now he was proclaiming the gospel to them and starting the church there with these people. And that causes Paul to shift from praying every day, God, I thank you, I'm not like these people, to starting up a church exclusively of these people. And what, what causes Paul to change? He encountered Jesus Christ. He encountered the resurrected Jesus. Paul, well, Saul and then became Paul, received the gospel-saving message. When that happens, you just cannot stay the same. It changes your whole being. It changes everything about you. When you encounter the resurrected Jesus, whatever form that is for Paul, who was on the road to Damascus, he actually heard the voice of Jesus, he became blind, he was baptized, and was able to see again. But for us, you know, we encounter that in different ways. But whichever way you encounter it, when you put your faith in him, when you receive the gospel-saving message, it fundamentally shifts the way you view people. It fundamentally shifts who's allowed in your community then. And this is how what you believe about ultimate reality shapes your community and the people that you are involved with and the people that you interact with. To believe the gospel means that I believe my fellowship with God has nothing to do with my moral performance, has nothing to do with the culture or the background I came from, has nothing to do with my ethnicity or my race. But I get to enjoy fellowship with God solely, purely because of God's grace poured out for me in Jesus Christ. And because I believe that's the true of, true of ultimate reality, then I seek out fellowship with others not based on their performance or who they are, or their background, or their culture, or their race, or ethnicity. But I simply seek to extend the grace that God has given to me and all people in Jesus Christ. And it's our failure to live out the reality of the gospel that contributes to division among people. If I don't believe that ultimately I am made right with God purely by grace in Jesus Christ, it's all God's doing and nothing part of me, then I will inevitably seek my own righteousness. 
and acceptance in something else, often times of my own race or my own being or who I am that makes me be me. Instead of focusing on who I am in Jesus Christ as a forgiven child of God. And the gospel frees us not to get defensive, but instead to acknowledge and confront and repent of the sins in our own lives and in the sins of the society. And the gospel frees us to do this in the spirit of the love. Not, oh, look at them and what they're doing wrong. No, no, no. But instead to do it with God's spirit and love and gentleness. Because the gospel says that we are one in Jesus Christ. The gospel says that God has brought us into fellowship with him and one another. But nothing of our own doing or who we are, but purely by the grace and saving love of God. And we're meant to show that grace to one another and offer the world a vision of a new kind of community, one that is united by Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ. But we're not just a community, we're a community with convictions. The whole reason Paul's writing this letter is to thank the Philippians. Paul's writing this letter as he's in prison in Rome. And the Roman prison system is not like today. They didn't feed you. They didn't clothe you. You didn't get TV and video games and all the fancy stuff that prisoners have today. Oh, no. They got nothing when they were in prison. So the only way you ate or had anything was if people brought it and gave it to you. So these Philippian Christians, who should not have associated anything with the Jewish Pharisee people, did exactly that for Paul, though. They sent somewhere upwards of 1,200 miles from Philippi to Rome with a prison care package for Paul. But why would the Philippians take this incredible task of sending one of their own on a long and most definitely dangerous journey in order to bring Paul supplies? And then secondly, why is Paul in prison in the first place? The answer to those questions is the same. They believe the same ultimate reality, and that shapes their convictions. That both Paul and these Philippian Christians believe that the fundamental truth behind everything is that Jesus is Lord. And because of that, Jesus shapes our convictions. The whole reason that Paul's in prison is because he's viewed as an enemy of the state. He proclaims that Jesus is Lord instead of Caesar or any other government official. And the whole reason the Philippians sent Paul this gift is because that they believe Jesus is Lord and nothing else matters to them. And so they want Paul to continue to share that message even when he is in prison. And so they are convicted in the Lord. And this adversity actually pushes them forward in their conviction. You know, that may sound backwards, but let's think about it. Have you ever seen what a group of people who share the same convictions and belief do when one of their own faces adversity? They don't back away, but they actually get bolder in their convictions. Prime example, Martin Luther King Jr. You know, he was arrested. He was put in jail. What, did the civil rights movement slow down any? No. It was actually progressed. It thrust forward it. People were emboldened by Martin Luther King, J King Jr.'s arrest. So much that then it led to the historic March on Washington and what she gave his speech, I Have a Dream. You know, when people have shared convictions and beliefs, Adversity doesn't slow them down. It actually thrusts them forward. It progresses them. And we especially see that in the church, when the true convictions and true beliefs are in the true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we share that same conviction that Paul, the Philippians, and even Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. had. The conviction that Jesus is Lord, and that actually means something, not just on church on Sunday, it actually means something in every aspect of our lives throughout the entire week. 
I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. Every single issue that we deal with is actually a faith issue. It literally is. Because either your conviction's in Jesus Christ, or it isn't. And if it isn't, then you're going to follow the ways of the world and follow the ways of the devil. But if your conviction is in Jesus Christ, you seek the true ways, the ways of his word, the ways that truly bring goodness and peace to our lives. And what we believe about ultimate reality shapes our convictions in that. So may we turn away from the idols and instead live in light of reality that Jesus is Lord and because of that seek to rectify the deep disparities in our society. Oh, excuse me. May the Lordship of Jesus enable us to pursue a church, a city, a country, a whole entire world, yes, a world, in which differences are celebrated as reflections of the image of God and who God really made us to be in Him. May the Lordship of Jesus enable us to lower our defenses, to be honest about the divisions in our society. And there are many. It's not just one. It's many divisions. And even the divisions in our own personal lives, whoever we have those with in our families, in our workplaces, in our friends, to lower our defenses and to seek to live in a reality that we are all one in Jesus Christ with our brothers and sisters of all ethnicities, races, nationalities, cultures, tribes, and so forth. May we live with that conviction that Jesus is Lord. And finally, may we live then with contentment. And Paul says he's learned the secret to contentment, so I'm going to share that with you this morning. Remember, he's writing this from his prison cell in Rome, where he's got nothing. Nothing at all. You know what he says? It doesn't matter. He can be wealthy, he can be poor, he can be hungry, he can be full. It doesn't matter. Then every and any circumstance, no matter what it is, he is content. No matter what. And why does Paul say he's content? <clears throat> Because of the love of Jesus Christ. So can you say that you're content? Always in a state of satisfaction? Or are you always earning for more and more and more? <clears throat> more money. More toys. I don't mean just the little toys. More time. More promotions. More acceptance. More relationships. More recognition. More status. More success. More responsibility, more love, more whatever, more, more, more. That's kind of the society that we live in is always looking for more, more, and more. And then is it ever enough? Are we ever at the perfectly balanced time in life when we finally get the one thing that we desire and like, yes, I'm satisfied, or do we long for the next thing? What is it with phones? As soon as you get a, a new phone, the next one's come out right away. <laughs> then we've got to go get that one next. So what's the secret? How do we live in a state of satisfaction and contentment regardless of the circumstances? Exactly the point that Paul, I started out with. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That Paul can face anything, no matter what it is, because Christ is strengthening him. Paul can be content in any circumstance. Because Christ is strengthening him. So the secret to finding true contentment is looking to where you are drawing your strength from. And Paul says the secret to contentment is being strengthened by Christ. So if you're not content, you should ask, well, where am I drawing my strength from then? But temptation is usually to draw strength from ourselves or from others or from our circumstances. If I can be strong enough eternally, I can just get through this, then I'll be content. If I just have the right people surrounding me and supporting me, then I can be content. If, thing, if things are going my way, then I can be content. But of course, we know the reality is none of us are strong enough internally all the time. People will let us down. 
And if 20, this year 2020 has taught us anything, it's that our circumstances are never really ideal. So we have to draw our strength from something outside of us, from something outside of the group of people that we are with, from something outside of the circumstances that we are involved with. And where is that? Boom! Jesus Christ and him alone. And now it sounds all well and good. Yes, Pastor, I know that. That's why I come to church to be refreshed and strengthened again and reading the devotions and praying. But how does it actually work, though? It works when you recognize the biggest problems in your life and realize that they've actually already been solved. That left her own devices, <laughs> we're hopelessly lost in despair and sin. Turned in and over ourselves, we're turned away from the love of God. But God in his grace sent Jesus to take on our sin and the sin of the world and nail it to the cross. And because of Jesus' death and resurrection, you are forgiven. You are set free. You're welcome into a restored relationship, a restored community with the Father now and for all eternity. <clears throat> And when you see that the biggest problem in your life is already taken care of, and that is being a sinner, being separated from God, and that's been taken care of through Jesus' death and resurrection, you can draw strength from the reality that you can rest in that grace, and then you can find contentment. And from that place of contentment in the gospel, we can celebrate the reality that we are one in Christ. I heard this story back in 1996. This happened in Ann Arbor. There was a, a branch of the Ku Klux Klan came to hold a rally in Ann Arbor. Well, you know, the Ann Arbor residents heard about this, so they had a counter protest to, for, to tell them that they were not welcome there. Well, you know how that goes. It seems pretty tense. Um, you know, yelling back and forth at each other across the street. Well, all of a sudden, a lady had a megaphone, and she shouted out that there was um, a man who, who followed the Nazis was in their group. So guess what? Those counter-protests, they um, ran after that guy, knocked him down, started beating him and kicking him, and shouted out, kill the Nazi. Well, in the midst of all that going on, this 18-year-old girl, Keisha Thomas, she threw herself on top of the man's body to protect him from the blows of the mob. How incredible. A black teenage girl laid her life on the line to protect this man who actually hated her because of her color of skin. And where does that come from? Well, in interviews that follow, Keisha Thomas cited her Christian faith and said, when they dropped him to a ground, it was like two angels lifted up my body and laid it on top of him. See how Keisha's ultimate reality is shaped by the gospel? Not about who she was, not about the crowd and anything going on, but it was all about Jesus Christ, by her Savior, who laid down his life to save her. And because of that, her view of community and conviction was shaped so that she was present to speak out against racism and hatred in society that comes from both planes of the playing field. And her view of ultimate reality gave her the contentment to actually give up herself her whole life for the sake of one who was actually her enemy. So based on that, may you look to Christ on the cross and see that in him, you are united to brothers and sisters of all races. And may that lead you to live with conviction and contentment. Amen. Now may the love of God our Father guard your hearts and minds in our Savior Jesus Christ as he fills you with the Holy Spirit to see how you are a community of one in Jesus Christ with his conviction that he is Lord and how that brings contentment to our lives. Amen. We rise now as we join in the prayers of God's holy church.
invited by your word and encouraged by your promise of mercy, let us pray to the Lord for this day, for St. James Lutheran Church of Grand Rapids, for our nation, those who serve, <clears throat> for those who need healing, those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries, and those coming to the Lord's table, offering to him the petitions and supplications of a people confident of his promise to hear and answer us with mercy. Let us pray to the Lord for a welcoming spirit in our congregation, for boldness in our invitation to those without a church home, and for a willingness to serve our neighbor in need and a stranger whose lives cross our paths. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord for St. James Lutheran Church of Grand Rapids, its mission and its people, its leaders, and its pastor, giving them the ability to meet the needs that arise as they do the work he has given them to do in proclaiming the saving truth of his word. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord for all elected and appointed civil servants, for all judges and magistrates, for all emergency personnel, for all members of the armed forces, and for all of us as citizens and neighbors, that we may all serve with honor, godly wisdom, and common sense. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord for compassion toward the sick and those who suffer, for our care of those who need our assistance, for the hospitalized and those recovering, for an end to death and sorrow, for the comfort of those who grieve, for the strength of those facing, facing death, and especially for those named in our bulletin, including Bill Van Effen, who fell all of his deer blind and broke some ribs and completely injured his spine so that he is now um, handicapped, that the Lord continue to be with him and his family during this time, and for all those we name in our hearts now. that God may grant them healing, comfort, and strength, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. let us pray to the Lord for gratitude and receiving the Lord's gifts and blessings. And for those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week, including Mandy and Jesse Scott, Felicity Keel, and Lindsay Bro, that as they celebrate another year of life for marriage, he continues to watch over them, providing for all their needs and granting them joyful celebrations. That they, that they be granted another year of life for marriage to come, if it be as well, so they may continue to cherish, grow, and abide in his love and saving grace. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray to the Lord for our communion upon the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and for hearts that burn with desire for the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom without end. Lord, in your mercy, all these things, Lord, we pray you to grant us according to your mercy in Jesus Christ, and to fill us with contentment, that trusting in your gracious will for all things, our hearts may enjoy perfect rest and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. Continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary. We should at all times and in all places, no matter who we are with, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we log to magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
always remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As a kingdom and a power and a glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, and I was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them all, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is in the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Just do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace and conviction of our Lord be with you always.
going to sing the song of Simeon and not the minutes. <laughs> Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to the Almighty God that you refresh us through the salutary gift. We ask you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another as the one body in Christ. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, our God, now and forever. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. And with Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and fill you with his everlasting peace, hope, joy, and love. We remain standing as we join in praising our Savior with him. 803, joyful, joyful, we adore thee.
may be seated. Again, a blessed morning to you all on this 19th Sunday after Pentecost. The church here is winding down here. Um, well, it's October and everything else, and pretty soon being Thanksgiving, and then Advent. Um, and looking forward to all those things, we have a council gathering after fellowship while we're downstairs. Uh, so again, council members, I ask you to stick around. There's actually quite a bit on at least my agenda to go through as we look forward to what's happening and other things, just to keep us updated and so forth. So please join us for that, because on October 19th, Monday night, we have a blood drive from 2 to 6, and don't worry, everything will be cleaned up by 7 o'clock for our voters meeting. Uh, so again, blood drive will be taking place, and the UP is always in need of all blood types. Last I looked, it was like A negative, an O and a B, I think they're really in need of. Um, you can give blood whenever you want to, but they at least want an eight-week time period in there. These blood drives here are actually ten weeks apart. So anyway, the next one coming up is October 19th here at Trinity. Um, and that's from 2 to 6, and then 7 o'clock we have our voters gathering to update everyone else about what's happening and the year ahead and looking at our budget and other things that we need to address. So please uh, attend those if possible. Uh, this Thursday, uh, wait, backtrack. Thank you to everyone who helped out with Feeding America. Um, we, we gave out, we, we um, what do I say, serviced or provided for 347 families from, what was it, I think 12 different communities at least came, if I remember correctly. Um, so yeah, so thank you to everyone who helped out. Um, there's still some things we're working out in there yet, but again, thank you everyone and spreading the word. The next one is going to be November 5th, and then there won't be any until January. So again, please tell people November 5th coming up. And thank you to everyone who came yesterday for a hike uh, for Heat Broad Fry. Um, we raised yesterday $265, I think. Not as much as we normally do in the walk. Where we used to be a walk for warmth. We go from church to church to church, but it's still a little something we had. Um, and if you saw it's in the bulletin again this week because all this month here at Trinity and actually all over we're collecting donations for the hike for heat. Uh, you can leave an offering plate, it'll get counted and then we'll send it over to NAMA for that. So again, all this month the hike for heat. Um, after this, I'm not going to print the bulletin anymore, I just did it to remind people and to show everyone again. We're still collecting money. They'll be in the back if you want to form. You can write your name on there, color too if you want to, so I can place them all over the elevator door there. That's fine. But again, thank you to everyone who's already contributed and helped out yesterday. I do need to apologize. I left my own daughter's birthday out of the bulletin. <laughs> I get the birthdays off the Google Calendar, and I didn't put my family on there. And so I completely missed it. But anyway, um, just because I did that, why don't we sing her happy birthday? Because then she can watch it. I'll show her online later, and I know she'll be tickled pink, so... Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Christian, Felicity, <laughs> happy birthday to you, may Jesus bless you, may Jesus bless you, may he guide you and keep you. May Jesus bless you. I'll show her that later on, and know she'll be happy. And, and on behalf of her, thank you. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, yeah, so Thursday night is TLC night. Uh, it'll be taking place at the Parsonage. So if you're able to come uh, Thursday night for a delicious uh, meal, and we'll actually be talking about birthdays. And where do we get birthdays from? Or where do we get? Obviously, where do we get birthdays from? Um, <laughs> But uh, in relation to scripture and faith and, and all that, so join us if you can Thursday night at 6.30. Now, before then, though, join us downstairs for a little bit of a meal, fellowship over. I saw some nice, wonderful goodies downstairs. And we still do have coffee. Dad made us coffee this morning, even with them with construction. We still have coffee this morning, so join us. Uh, warm up uh, before you head back out today. As you go in peace.